Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, episode 49. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Morty Golding. Morty is is director of content for LinkedIn Learning. He oversees the creation of a vast library of high-quality learning content, primarily in the form of on-demand, online, and video-based courses. He did similar work for lynda.com prior to its acquisition by, by LinkedIn. Morty, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It is my pleasure. You know, it's a real treat for me. Um, in part for some of the connections that we talked about before we started recording, the fact that I love creating content as well. You know, Mm -hmm. as a former educator and currently a coach, uh, constantly doing things. In fact, just last night, I talked to a bunch of real estate professionals on the topic of mindset and breaking through when you have the endless grind, so to speak, of trying to get deals done, et cetera. And so I'm excited to learn all about you know, without getting too much into the weeds about the specific nature of content creation, mm-hmm. you know, I'd love to learn more about it and really the impact that uh, your work and LinkedIn work, LinkedIn's work is doing specifically in terms of content creation for, you know, users of the platform. And so before we get into that, I'd love to learn how does, you know, how do you get into such a thing? You know, how do you get started? It's kind you of fall, like a unique, you fall backwards. different, <laughs> unique, yeah. different type of profile. Certainly not, the, certainly not the plan. Um, I, uh, obviously now focus primarily on, uh, helping to create learning content. Um, but I started out as a graphic designer. Uh, when I was younger, I always loved both art and also technology. And, you know, they always say like, there's a certain time where things just are right. And that was a time where the idea that there was personal computers, it was, you know, the eighties, there was a lot of you know, technology, there was a lot of art that was kind of moving digital, digital photography was kind of starting. Um, So I just felt that there was going to be something, I didn't know what it was going to be, but there was going to be some career path for me that involved both technology and also design. I actually did graphic design for about 20 years. Um, And uh, I also just personally, you know, love to help other people. Like for me, it was a challenge to kind of figure out Tech, how to use technology in order to do certain things in design. And I think that was a time frame where uh, technology was kind of new. There were a lot of people that knew how to design or understood things about typography, but computers weren't really there yet from a high professional perspective. Um, like we take for granted a lot of things like how a font looks. Like in the old days, you actually didn't know what your document was going to look like until you printed it, right? You know, the, the, when the laser writer came out, it was like, oh my God, wow, you can actually print something on a paper and what you see on your computer screen is the same thing you see when you print it out. So that was like kind of a crazy thing. So because I like technology a lot and I liked art, I used to try to like find ways to kind of solve problems um, in a creative fashion, if you will. And there were a lot of people in the design field who were struggling with using technology. It was clear that the, that the industry was going that way. And I was able to somehow help people kind of bridge that gap and teach them, oh, you're trying to accomplish this kind of look. Here's how you could get the computer to actually do that kind of a thing. And I ended up creating books, uh, you know, like those how-to books, like, you know, uh, Adobe products for dummies and things like that. So um, ended up uh, creating a whole bunch of books and then got the attention of Adobe. Adobe actually hired me to be a product manager for one of their products. Um, and I got into the world of actually technology, and that to me was kind of just an eye-opening experience. Uh, I left Adobe after about three years, um, primarily for personal reasons, and then just basically traveled the world teaching people how to use Adobe products. And in that process, at the same time, like this was before YouTube, people started putting like courses that were video-based courses online, and I became friendly with some woman named Linda Weinman who was doing that for her company. Uh, and after doing courses online for quite some time, I realized this is a thing. Like you can pretty much see that online education and the idea that people can access learning is beyond just learning how to use Adobe products, but you can actually extend that to many different things. Um, so I ended up joining lynda.com as a, um, as a person to oversee strategy. So that was actually, I would say, like a pivot of my career, and that's where I had kind of made a decision to say, 
content creation now is much more important than for me. It was really, it was really about design and how do I teach people design? And it was more about the realization that there was this medium, which was online video, where anybody at any particular time could actually see what you're doing. And that idea of like saying, wow, we can actually teach that across multiple topics. We could teach people how to use Excel, how to manage their time, how to think about communicating better. Um, that I think was a point where I said, I will join the company. And since then, my focus has been on trying to identify what things are possible to teach in video form and then try to find a way to deliver that. Um, and, you know, years later, LinkedIn bought us and I'm still doing the same thing. But that's kind of how I got into it. It's not a, uh, it's not like I went to school and said, this is what I'm doing around content creation. It was more about the evolution of kind of seeing the world and technology kind of changing around and the convergence of that. Yeah, I love the story. And I actually love when stories that I hear, such as yours, um, line up well with things that I'm either reading or learning about, et cetera. So uh, I'm a big, I talk about this on the podcast all the time. I'm a huge Audible fan. Mm -hmm. I listen to content in the car. My, my work requires in the greater New York area and beyond a lot of travel. And so I'm in the car all the time. And that's the way that I just, I learn because frankly, to find the time to sit down and open up a book for me is very challenging. It just, yeah. you don't have the time for it. So I'm listening to a book, not for the first time, called So Good They Can't Ignore You. And the author, yes. Cal Newport, talks about the idea of following your passion is a bad idea. You know, so often you hear it, Steve Jobs and others, they talk about follow your passion. If this is what you do, you'll get a career in it, you'll love it, and everything will be wonderful. But the reality is, at the least, without developing career capital around it, it's going to be awfully difficult for you to go ahead and say, this is what I'm passionate about. Now let's monetize, you know, now pay me for my passion, so to speak. And so I heard from you like a, an interest in a variety of areas, technology and art and some other things. And that was your initial interest. You could say your passion, but you got really good at it and you became an expert in the field. And one thing led to the next, to the point where you are today. And you now have the the gravitas to be able to do a variety of things based on those experiences. Right. And that's really important for people when they're transitioning. I have the same issue. Um, something I also mention on the, on the, uh, on the podcast all the time that I began in the coaching space after years of educational uh, instruction, as well as uh, leadership experience. And those were great, wonderful years. And I still do quite a bit of it. And frankly, every time I get up in front of an audience, I still feel myself as a teacher sharing. And that's my passion. But at the same time, I did not have any meaningful capital yet in the coaching space. And I needed to develop that. Thankfully, I had relationships and things that I could do. And I was able to get started. But now I'm finding almost six, into, six years into this part of my journey, that this is, it's, it's all starting to really come together for me. You know, more and more referrals, more and more conversations, more and more people to whom I feel I can make a meaningful difference with and actually have focused and informed conversations where I can say, this is how I can help you. Whereas in the past, I was sort of like fumbling for words. You know, I didn't really have the language. I felt I could help, but I didn't know exactly how to express it and how to really identify what are the challenges, pain points, et cetera, and now I can jump in and make a difference. So I, I think your journey really resonates, certainly with me on a personal level, but I think for Lead to Succeed Nation, everybody listening to our conversation, we all have processes. And in today's day and age, the likelihood of you starting and ending in the same spot, let, forget the same company, but even in the same career, is diminishing significantly. And we have to be able to continually learn and to um, repurpose ourselves and our experiences and things like that. And I think that your story is a great example. It's certainly the way that the world is kind of built today, right? That's, that's the design thinking approach, right? Where it's never just like one individual kind of path. It's really kind of like looking at multiple things and then trying to see how you can combine those to provide a unique vision, if you will, and to establish yourself in a place that other people uh, do not have. Yeah. And I think it's really important for folks who are mid, mid career, I would say, you know, in their forties, early fifties, I'm coaching some people now who are, they see the handwriting on the wall in their corporate space. They either aren't happy or they think they're going to be phased out soon or things like that. And now they're like, well, what do I do? Right. You know, so as we think more, and this by the way is a great, and I'm going to segue into 
um, the content creation piece, because that to me is really an important part of our conversation. That's a reason people should be going to LinkedIn and watching your videos or listening to podcasts and reading books and things like that, because you never know where the next opportunity may present itself and how if you have a robust, you can't be a jack of all trades. You want to get really good. On my last podcast, I had Brian Wallace and he talked about the idea of having a stack of skills mm -hmm. where not one or two necessarily, but maybe a half a dozen of different things and how those could you know, come together in one stage and then perhaps be repurposed in another place. And I think it's the same kind of idea over here. So let's actually talk about because I'm interested from my leadership perspective. This is a leadership podcast after all. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what are, um, how, how can a leader, before we get into what you specifically create, from a leadership angle, if you were kind of advising, you were like a whisperer in the ear of a CEO or a leader, and you wanted to advise them about how they can use content or information sharing as a way by which to lead better, do you have any strategies to suggest? Yeah, I mean, there's two parts to that. Like one of them is the content consumption part, which is ensuring that you are uh, ingesting enough to make sure that you have the ability to innovate, to come up with ideas, to make connections, to be able to provide inspiration to other people, right? That's the difference between leadership and management, right? Leadership are people who uh, inspire people to action as opposed to management that usually tells people specifically do A, B, and C. Yep. Right? So you don't, that doesn't happen, like, you know, there's the book Mindset by Carol Dweck, which is about like growth mindset, which is we aren't necessarily born with a, you know, finite set of ideas in our head that we just go ahead and kind of put it out. There's a constant cycle of you need input and then that will generate some kind of output. Uh, there's also a great book uh, by Austin Kleon, Steal Like an Artist, right? And he talks about how important it is for you to fuel your ideas, right? And the only way that you do that is through reading or through uh, spending time not doing your regular job, but just looking at what's interesting for you and who knows what kind of ideas they can kind of generate. So that's why it's important. I think LinkedIn is, a, is an example of a great destination to get awesome, relevant content. And we can talk more about that later, as opposed to just going to Google and say, tell me something interesting. Um, but uh, that's one way, which is to make sure that you are spending enough time. I'll share that, like for me, usually I spend about two hours a day consuming content. And I don't believe I have the ability to create a whole bunch of content without having that a quote that I saw, the, uh, Stephen, I was a big Stephen King fan when I was younger. Um, and he actually wrote a book called On Writing. Uh, and it's a book about like what it means to be a writer. It's not all the crazy stuff that he usually writes about. An incredibly fantastic book. I mean, he obviously is a professional writer. And he says basically that as a writer, he says, if I am not reading other people's stuff, I have no way to write or to innovate on, on ideas. He needs to kind of uh, make sure that he is both a reader and then that makes him a writer, that kind of a thing. So I think that's the first part, which is make sure you're spending time on consuming content. Like I said, I spend two hours a day. You know, maybe people don't want to commit that much, but, you know, I think that's an important part. You need to fuel the beast, if you will. I before, think the, Before you pivot, Morty, if you, sure. if you don't mind. So, so talk to us. We're all busy. Yeah. Right? We, we, we have a lot of time constraints. Um, how does somebody, how do you, and maybe how do you advise others? I, I talked about listening in the car, for example, to, you know, to audiobooks. But what, what is your method? How do you find the time or make the time, I should say, for content consumption? So, I mean, I'll go back to your comment before about this. There are different times in your career or, or areas, I guess, in your life where there are like, people who are new in their career who are just kind of starting out um, may uh, have less control over the amount of time they have at work. Once you, though, get into, let's say, the middle of your career or even later on in your career, I think you have to do a better job on, of establishing ownership over your time, right? I think we sometimes live in this world where we believe that other people control our time. If you live by your inbox and whatever is, you know, emails kind of come your way, that's what ultimately determines what you do, then I think that, you know, you are giving all that control over to somebody else. But I think the first thing to do is to say to yourself, do you agree that spending X amount of time and whatever that is, let's say it's two hours a, a week, or let's say it's two hours a month, or let's say it's two hours a day, whatever that's going to be, block that time off in your calendar for that kind of activity, right? Because it's really, honestly, it's, it's about time management. I'll share that um, 
you know, one of the courses we have in a library, uh, we, we work with an author named Dave Crenshaw. Uh, he has a book uh, called Invaluable, and he talks a lot about time management. I actually hired him as a time management consultant. We sat down together. We worked on really identifying what I felt were the most valuable things that I needed to do for my career. And then we wiped my calendar clean, and we just started with those. We put blocks into the calendar for those things. And then we had leftover time for the, all the other stuff that we filled in. But those were already blocked off as priorities. That's so huge. Yeah. It needs to be intentional. That's all I'll say. Like, these things, if you take the approach, it, it applies to really anything. Like, if you want to spend more time with your kids or you want to spend more time with your family, if you just wait for when I have some free time to do that, then your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids, you know, will we'll be out there and, and you'll realize like, oh, where did all that time kind of go? That's right. Right? But yeah, if you intention is critical. Yeah. So that's what I think it needs to be. It needs to be intentional. Again, it goes back to do you value that kind of – now, it could be that people don't agree and say – actually just reading stuff or, or scrolling through LinkedIn or, you know, reading books is a waste of time. And if that's the case, then that's your prerogative. Um, but whatever it is that you decide is a high value thing for your development of your career. Or if you set a goal for the future in five years, I want to be here. <clears throat> and even if you don't know crystal clear what that's going to be, but you have some idea that I'm not happy where I am now and I want to get somewhere later or my team is in one place now and I want my team to be able to be in this place a year from now. That needs to be intentional, and then you need to put that into your calendar and make that your priority. Yeah, I, I want to stay on this for just a moment and then let mm -hmm. you pivot back to the previous question. Sure. Um, but that thing that you just mentioned, Morty, is critical. I actually mentioned this again last night. Oftentimes, at the most, people will make a to-do list of yeah. things that they want to accomplish. And to-do lists have, have value, but not as much as we often think. And sometimes they could have challenges in terms of completing them and really prioritizing and using your time effectively. You talked about being intentional, blocking your calendar. These are critical pieces. And thinking about and reminding yourself of the value is something I just wanted to accentuate also because oftentimes we become uh, focused and motivated by the things that we think will really drive us to the next place. And if we can connect intellectually, and I would even add emotionally, to the benefit, how is it going to feel for me to be in a new, you talked about, you know, a career transition. How will it feel for me to be able to transition from where I am today to where I want to be in terms of finances, in terms of, you know, autonomy and, and, and control over my calendar and, and, and whatever else you're seeking and have that mental image in your mind as part of your goal setting, as part of your time blocking, that's going to drive you to actually follow through because it's often not that we lack time. It's we lack the ability to discern and to, dis in a disciplined way, make decisions around what I really should be doing versus what I ultimately wind up doing. And I think that's an important distinction that we have to make. So you talked yeah. about, as a leader, consuming content, right. becoming cutting edge, remaining there, constantly learning. What was the other piece you wanted to mention as it relates to leading through content creation? Well, the other part is then... Uh just because I mean, don't keep it to yourself. Like in that experience of you finding something, you will ultimately come upon a piece of content that you find inspiring or that you enjoy or that you felt uh, would be valuable. The next step is then to actually share that. Uh, and sharing it doesn't just mean just like, here's an article, sharing it into my feed on LinkedIn or emailing it to people on my team. But it means that applying some kind of commentary onto what you felt was inspiring or valuable about that. And that's the part of like the combination of curation and, and, and creation of content, right? You're pulling out, like you're highlighting one or two sentences from that article that you found valuable. And you share that with your team proactively, whatever channel works, like Slack, Microsoft Teams, email, on LinkedIn if you want it to be public. Like there's a whole, you know, bunch of stuff, options out there, I think, for you to kind of take advantage of that. But you need to now choose what it was that was inspiring to you. And I think this is the thing that people sometimes just uh, under index on, which is the reason why a platform like LinkedIn is so valuable is because it's curated by people who are in your network, which means that you immediately have some amount of value for that. If there's somebody on LinkedIn that you find inspirational, there's someone on LinkedIn that you find valuable and they recommend a piece of content, you will probably have a, a higher reason for you to, to, to be motivated to look at that piece of content. Likewise, if, imagine if it was a manager in your company or if there's a, an inspirational leader at your company, your CEO, 
says or references a book, do you not think that most people in that company would be motivated to, to, to read that book? And I think that leaders need to understand that power that they have. I think sometimes you, even, you know, leaders don't have to be CEOs. Leaders don't have to be VPs. An individual person can be a leader, right? Meaning other people can find that person inspirational. And I think that people don't realize that, that power that you have by you sharing something, so many other people are going to get inspired by that. And I think that ultimately leads towards people in better positions because more and more people find that you are influential. And that, that's the key word, influence, right? If you can influence others, ultimately that puts you in a better position. It sure does. And I remember attending, um, I wrote a book about a year and a half ago called Becoming the New Boss. It's actually creeping up on two years at this point already. Um, and I attended an author's conference. And I remember one of the presenters was talking about podcasting. It was one of the um, pieces that ultimately led me to start the Lead to Succeed podcast. And, and his context was actually internal. He was a um, he had been uh, in, in, in broadcasting and in media for many years, and then he had transitioned to internal, let's call it um, communications and whatnot within a, large, within a large firm. And he started a podcast within the company. And so he'd have conversations with internal and external folks and whatnot about industry-related topics or whatever it might be. And that became a platform and a medium for content sharing as well. So whatever you choose, whether it's your own content, curating, like you said, and sharing other people's things, the most important thing is that you do it in a way where people get value from it and they see you as the leader, I would think, as somebody who's not only interested in saying, this is what makes me great, you know, if you will, but, but I'm willing to give you ideas from wherever I find them that's going to help you do your work better. And it's going to help you really grow and develop. And, and as a leader, my role is to kind of facilitate your learning, facilitate your growth. It's like a servant leadership concept. Yep. And then, totally. and then, and, and sharing content is just one way by which to do that. So let's, let's talk now about leader content, specific consumption. Um, I, I actually have two questions in it. You can, you can focus on either one um, or both. Uh, question number one is what content do you find leaders are most interested in learning? I'm curious about that as somebody who works with leaders. What do they find are their biggest areas of, let's call it concern or gaps or things like that? And number two, what do you think leaders really need to know that they don't often think on their own to pursue? So I'll, I, I can't tell you what, I, you know, what, what leaders uh, want to learn, but I can tell you what leaders are learning. You know, I, it's funny, like, you know, um, just preparing for our discussion today, I kind of just pulled some data out of LinkedIn and looked at our own content. And I looked at people who are in senior positions at companies. So people in the C-suite, people who are, let's say, director and up, people who normally would be associated with leadership positions. And I pulled up what courses are they watching? And at least that's kind of, I don't know what they want to watch, but that's what they are watching. I'm okay. not really sure about that aspect of it. But at the top of the list, I would say there's like four main categories, uh, leadership and management, which is probably not a surprise, mm -hmm. um, business software, professional development, and data science. And, and I'll be a little bit more specific about what actual courses or what specific, like those are pretty broad topic areas. Yes. But specifically within leadership and management, um, the thing that comes, comes to the top is emotional intelligence, mm. um, communicating with confidence, body language, and then one which I thought was really interesting, uh, which – you know, uh, I can talk more about like our approach to how we create content. So I'm happy to see that this is up on the list, but it wasn't because we, this is something that we thought people should know, but probably don't know about it, which is leading without formal authority. Like a lot of people I think normally associate that they get into a position of leadership and then they are given that authority to lead. But as we spoke about before, you don't need to be in a, a VP at a company to be a leader. There are individuals who can establish and inspire other people at a company. Uh, so there's this idea of like being a leader without somebody actually putting the, the leadership hat on you and identifying you as a leader. Mm, um, nice. So that, those are the things that I would say specifically in that space. Uh, in business software, uh, Excel is just a tool that everyone needs. And there's actually a correlation between that and data science. So the reason why data science is showed, it shows up on this is not because uh, I think leaders need to learn SQL and, and start actually doing data science, which is a very, very difficult uh, uh, thing to do. Um, 
But the, the, two, uh, the two courses that rise to the top uh, are data analytics, just learning, understanding how to use data analytics, um, and business analysis, right? So those are key things. If you're a leader, you really need to know how to take the data that your data science teams or that other people provide to you and be able to make decisions based on that data. There are a lot of people who just unfortunately, uh, it's new to them, this idea about all the data that you have available to you, and there's so much of it to learn how to access that kind of stuff. And then on the professional development side, I would say like there were three things that kind of rose to the top. Uh, critical thinking, strategic thinking, and time management, which we discussed before. So those are like the, the courses that get the most views by people who are in senior positions at companies. Uh, so I take that as, you know, a good indicator, you know, to kind of what's up there. But emotional intelligence, like I said, was kind of at the top. And to me, I would say that right now, if I have to think about like a gap, Nobody asks really um, to learn, like nobody's searching for emotional intelligence. A lot of the ways that people access our content is companies usually establish competencies. And then we map content towards driving that. So let's say for a company wants to be more innovative. So they want to establish a competency of innovation. Now, what are they going to do in order to drive that towards that? It's not like you don't take a course on in innovation and then you instantly become innovative, right? So it's a, it's a combination of multiple skills that you try to develop. Right, it's more, a competency might be considered a cluster of skills instead of a single skill. So, one of those like larger clusters that now are top of mind at, uh, at companies today is around diversity, inclusion, belonging, and a lot of that ties into emotional intelligence. Like we're seeing now, more people struggling with anxiety at work, more people struggling with mental wellness issues. Right, and I think a lot of the jobs of leadership and management is to ensure that your employees are getting the support that they need. You know, a lot of people now literally are checking emails at two o'clock in the morning when they shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff. So leaders need to really be kind of be thinking about like, what is the talent of my company doing? How am I kind of treating that talent and making sure that uh, they are taking courses or that they are themselves are kind of tapping into awareness around those issues? And I'll give you a great example about that. Um, it took me a while as a leadership to kind of wrap my head around not sending a, a really big, scary email about a big project that's coming on a, on a Friday afternoon when you know people are kind of going into the weekend, right? You might want to get it off your plate, but understanding how other employees might read that email at that time uh, is emotional intelligence, right? Beautiful. Um, you know, that's one example. Like being like, I have a policy right now. I never send emails out on the weekends because it sends that message that, oh, that's expected that you should be checking your email on the weekends, right? So as a leader, you need to be setting those examples for that. So that idea, the larger understanding of emotional intelligence, like it's again, a larger bucket, I think right now is a skill that people don't pay enough attention to, but clearly in the marketplace, when you talk about like what drives employee engagement, happiness at work, how people enjoy their jobs, it's not the amount of work that they have, it's the overall environment and how they're treated, uh, how, whether they feel that they are included in the team, so on and so forth. Great. There's so much to unpack there, mm -hmm. and we're not going to have time to do it all. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one small comment and then one bigger response as sure. well. On the smaller side, what uh, Gmail just started this. I don't know exactly when, but I woke up to this reality about a month or so ago that now you can start to schedule your sends. Boomerang. Yeah. Which is, yeah, which is very powerful because oftentimes you want to get, like, for example, you're, you're crafting this email on a Friday. It's top of mind for you. You know you want it to be ready. But you know you can't send it on a Friday because everybody, like you said, is checking out. They may or may not be in the office. And certainly you're not going to get the response that you want. But you just click on the option to send it on Monday or maybe Tuesday in the morning. And so it's, it's, it's scheduled, it's re ready to go, you, whether you're using a CRM or any other tool, but you schedule that piece that's critical so that you know it's done, but at the same time, it's being delivered at a time that your audience is, is most ready for it. And I use that when I'm sending out, uh, whether it's MailChimp or any other type of, mm -hmm. uh, of emails that I'm using, I always think about the time that it'll be delivered and the, you know, trying to get into the minds of the recipient. I think that's an important piece. The other thing that I think is just fascinating, but not surprising, certainly not to me, is the overwhelming, um, how should I say this? If I, if I categorized all the courses that you talked about, 
almost all of them fall in my mind into the soft skills bucket. You know, there are some hard skills, there's some technical skills, certainly data analysis, the analytics and things like that. I but tell. fundamentally, in most cases, as a leader, and I talk about this a lot in my book, it's, it's fascinating to me. I didn't even realize it as I was writing the book, but as I reflected on it when it was done, the overwhelming amount of emphasis that I place, and I think that really needs to be placed on soft skills, relationships, communication, emotional intelligence, all these things, because you know, when you are working up the proverbial food chain, you know, getting to the top of the totem pole, you're trying to, in most cases, to demonstrate capacity. So it's all about, in most cases, your technical skills, your ability to demonstrate your ability, you know, your ability to demonstrate your ability, these kinds of things. <laughs> and then at the same time, you get to the top or wherever the top is, it may not be the very top, but wherever you're now in a, uh, in a managerial or leadership role, all of a sudden you're shifting from me to we. And you're thinking about how do I create the environment necessary for my people to shine, for them to be happy, to be motivated, to be driven, to be innovative, all the things you want from your people. How do you leverage you know, all your experiences and things like that, but at the same time realize you're no longer doing the heavy lifting on a work level in most cases, at least you shouldn't, and how do you instead become a lever to, to get everybody else moving in that direction. And so, like I said, and we talk about this on the podcast all the time, the idea that soft skills are so important mm -hmm. and we need to be thinking about how do I become more emotionally intelligent and how do I work on these other pieces? So it's great to see that not only is it something I preach and something I think about, but you see it in the, in the data that you're collecting at LinkedIn, which is a very powerful, um, you know, collection of some of the world's top leaders that they are coming to you for that content specifically because they they may feel they know how to do their job uh, from a technical standpoint but they need the help you know yeah. on the soft skills angle that's and, for sure i will share by the way on ahead, a, please. On a, a, specifically within the context of emotional intelligence a lot of our research now we're finding that people associate soft skills as being interpreted as feminine skills, just uh -huh. the word itself connotates that way. So we've, sh we've pivoted more towards using the term human skills instead of soft skills. Interesting, interesting. And you're not even doing it from a, a PC perspective. You're no, doing it purely from that, a, you know, because people will resonate better or will pursue it more if they feel it speaks to them. Exactly. So it's a branding piece. Yes. Interesting, I like it. Okay, so um, we all know that success is the outgrowth of failure. And yeah. we recognize that there's no way to achieve the level of experience and expertise that we want without having some less than uh, glorious moments in our history. So I'm gonna ask you as I ask my guests um, to describe a failure that you encountered, a setback, or at least an apparent failure, what looked like a failure at the time that eventually set you up for future success. I mean, I, it's it's hard to identify that just because for me, failure is just like part of the regular vernacular. Like it's just regular work. You know, I don't see it as like a moment in time. And again, I go back to like the concepts in in Carol Dweck's book around mindset, which is like failure is like natural, like it's a uh, it's breathing. Um, so, but if I had to like kind of find a time uh, to put a, some kind of label of failure on it, it was it was when I chose to leave Adobe. Um, I was there for three years. I'll never forget the first day I walked into my office at Adobe in San Jose, California. Um, the elevators opened up and I walked it onto the 11th floor, which was the floor that Adobe Illustrator's team was on. And I, w I had this like, the angels were singing and there was a halo over my head and it was like, it was literally like the dream job. And I somehow magically, that was kind of, you know, by the grace of God kind of gifted to me. Uh, and I never imagined ever leaving there. And it was really a glorious three years that I was there. Um, but I made the personal decision to move back to the East Coast. It was something that my wife and I had kind of decided was right for the family. So leaving Adobe at that time was, you know, it was like literally walking away from, from that dream job. Uh, and it was kind of like, uh, you, could, you could assume that that would be something like a failure of my career. Like I wasn't able to make it work, right? I had this amazing opportunity and I held on to it as long as I could, but I kind of I gave it up. However, I would say that that kind of put me on a path more towards like really leveraging all the things that I've kind of learned uh, to then help me continue to, again, continuously kind of reinvent or pivot my career. And that time it was going to training, but it was also leveraging all those relationships. Like I would not have been successful. I would not have met lynda.com. I, you know, I would not have met uh, all the clients and the customers that I ended up working with had I not had that time at Adobe. 
And for me, it was a way to kind of like, even though at the time it didn't appear that way, but I significantly stepped up in my career and I had more opportunities available to me because of that. So I, I think a lot of times you'll hear stories about people who were in a job and then they got laid off and they fell on hard times. And then uh, another opportunity came that they did not realize. And that I think is kind of common. I think what's interesting about, about at least my journey on this one is that's actually where I had the job that I always wanted and I chose to walk away from it. And yet that was still something that ended up being something that was incredibly valuable and, yeah, and offered far greater returns. That, that is, there's what, there's certainly what to learn from that. And, and whether, whether we, uh, like you said, have to pivot in our careers by choice mm -hmm. um, or it's kind of handed to us and, and we have to move on. One of the important things to think about is that it's not over. You know, we're on yeah. a journey. You use that term, and I think it's a great term. Uh, we never know where the path will ultimately wind up, but if we kind of continue on it and we keep our head high and we have the right mindset and all the things you've been mentioning, Morty, uh, it'll bring us, typically speaking, to a better place sooner, hopefully, than later. So that's a great time for us to segue into our rapid fire. Okay. This first one may be hard to express in a very concise way, but I'm going to try, and hopefully you can do it for us as well. What's Challenge one... Accepted favorite LinkedIn tip or hack that you could give us, um, you know, to help us use the platform better? Um, so uh, from a data perspective, the magic number uh, in order for LinkedIn to provide value to you is 30 connections. So once a person hits 30 connections, LinkedIn now becomes in, uh, exponentially more valuable to you because the network now has enough data on, uh, on your preferences and who you are connected with in order to provide more value back to you. I think sometimes people often forget that. Like the signals that you provide to LinkedIn help LinkedIn provide more relevant content back to you. And, and the exact same thing applies in the extreme. A lot of people like, you know, beat their chest and say, I have 18 billion connections or whatever the max now, 30,000 or 30, whatever. 30,000, yeah. Yeah, I'm mean, like, that's not the goal for LinkedIn. Like that, there's an option at LinkedIn that you can choose to have followers. So if you want to use LinkedIn to be able to get your message out, followers are the best way to do it. But the more people you connect to, the more noise you will introduce into your relevant signal, meaning you'll see content that's not valuable, valuable to you. Like if you connect to somebody because maybe you want to reach out to them to sell them something and it turns out it doesn't work out, keeping them, that person as a connection to you means that anytime they post something, it's going to show up in your feed and you don't care about that. So understanding the network that you build and the way that you kind of use LinkedIn, how that ultimately provides more value back to you is the best way to kind of think about that aspect of it. Great answer. Totally unfair of me to put this in the rapid fire section. I think we're going to have to, <laughs> I think we're gonna have to talk further because I think you got to yes. LinkedIn. We we'll need to unpack. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's go to some succinct ones here. A book you often gift or recommend. Uh, oh, Carol, Dweck's, Carol Dweck's mindset. mindset. That's the one I would say is okay. the, yeah. Um, a summer getaway spot everyone should know about since we're talking now in late June. <sighs> so I just remember, I, I work in California, but I live in New York. So my life is a vacation and a summer spot. So uh, I will say, though, that Santa Barbara is that's where one of our offices are. That's where the Linda.com offices are. Mm -hmm. I would say Santa Barbara is just gorgeous. Perfect weather. Uh, beautiful views and not too far from LA. And considering it's been raining the entire week out on the East Coast. Uh, <laughs> not a bad imagine idea. Imagine some good weather here. Yes. Okay. And finally, you have to put on your chef's hat for this one. No meal is complete without. Oh, man. I was going to say wine, but oh. the truth is, is that <laughs> I guess I just have, I, a I lot drink of, to that I one. have a lot of incomplete meals. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I was, and maybe, and, and maybe I guess good conversation is. With there you go. Part. Nice. I like it. Yeah. Okay. So um, give us uh, an opportunity. How can people find you, connect with you, learn more about your work and gain from, uh, from that connection? Um, so it's obviously easy to find me on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only Morty Golding on LinkedIn. So you can just search. Certainly the only one with the yellow glasses. <laughs> That's for much sure. I could. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so LinkedIn is the best way to get in touch with me. Uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can connect to me, although I'll say I very, very choosy about who I choose to connect to um, okay. for the reasons I outlined before. Uh, if you want to learn more about my work, uh, you can go to uh, linkedin.com slash learning, which is the library of content that we create of learning content, which is about 14, almost 15,000 courses 
uh, across seven different languages on pretty much any topic you can imagine as that, that would be helpful to people in their careers. All right. Before we let you go, Morty, you've given us a ton. Yes. But I'm going to ask you for one final life lesson, please, to kind of cap our conversation. Okay. Um, there's a saying that someone at our company, his name is Mike Derrison, that, that has kind of taught me. Uh, and it's a very short phrase, so it's easy to kind of hang up on your wall and remind you. And it's prioritize ruthlessly. Uh, there are a lot of uh, opportunities that come across your desk. Everything sounds like a great idea. Uh, and I would say like the most difficult thing to do is to choose what it is that you say yes to and what you say no to. And like every, every time you say yes to one thing, it means you're saying no to something else. Um, and uh, that's probably the most important thing. Like learn the art of learning how to choose the right things to work on. There's a great book by Seth Godin called The Dip, which I highly recommend. It's a very short book, um, which helps you kind of figure out like when you should quit or give up on on certain things and move on to the next thing. Uh, but yeah, that fast. idea of that idea of prioritizing ruthlessly is like a mantra which I kind of go back to all the time, which I think would be helpful to people. Awesome. Well, thank you for all of your wisdom and your experiences and sharing uh, various things that I think have added tremendous value. Uh, anyone who's going to listen is going to learn a ton. So Morty, really a pleasure. Thank you for finding time from your busy schedule and you managed to prioritize this. So I'm honored yes. <laughs> and I'm glad that we had the conversation and looking forward to getting this out there soon. Awesome. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to head over to impactfulcoaching.com where you can sign up for our blog, download free leadership eBooks and so much more. 